quick recap. In our last video, we created a quick main scene as well as the base for our car controller. We have not yet worked on creating the hands, but we did create a deck which creates uh, 52 cards and can be used to deal out, uh, currently deals directly to the male hand, main hand, and we created the card object itself. By the end result of the last video, we made it so that we can display two cards that are being dealt. Unfortunately, all we get is this boring gray screen and this display on the output console. Today, we're going to expand from that lesson. We're going to continue to build up the uh, card scene. We're going to do a little bit of cleanup from uh, the last session and we're going to develop the hand so that we can actually display our cards. As far as cleanup goes, really all we have to do is make sure that we didn't accidentally save any of our scripts in the wrong place. I'm actually gonna move this main GD into here, which won't break anything. Um, Godot automatically kind of figures out where scripts are for the most part. I've never really had an issue with just moving stuff. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to change the project settings so that we have a nice black background. So if you go down in under rendering environment, we're going to change the default color to just a flat black. Now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to open up the card scene. And then we are going to add a sprite and a hitbox to the card. So go to the sprite there. Graphic we're going to use is under cards, and it should be the top one, depending on how you have it organized. But it's called card.png. Slide it right into texture there. So if you can see relative to the shape of the game area, it's actually really small. So we're going to change its transform and multiply its scale by five as the default size. And then under the collision, we're going to add a new rectangle shape 2D. And we're going to stretch this puppy out so that it covers the card. All right, so save that. And we're going to create a new 2D scene. And we're going to call it hand. After we created that, we're going to add a path to it. Path 2D. And then as a child of the path 2D, we're going to add a path follow 2D. And attached to the path follow 2D, we're going to add an additional child, simply a position 2D. And there's more as a child to the position 2D, we're going to add a sprite. Uh, this particular sprite is mostly for testing, feeling about and understanding how everything's getting laid out. So we're just gonna give it the default Godot sprite, but we're gonna change this transport, transform to a quarter of its size. And that should be good for that. So now we're gonna grab the path using Alt, we can drag. Oh yeah, it doesn't exist yet. All right, uh, so we're gonna create the path. Let's go and this our player cards are going to be down here as an example so we'll draw there and there and then we will select this so that we can modify the handles and we'll get a curve like that that should do for now uh, so the path follow will basically allow us to if we go to the path here we change the offset. So you can see everything that's hooked up to the path follow will move on the path relative to the offset. And that's one handy thing about having that icon is you can actually set it. So the offset goes to the end of the length of the line, which is around 215 or so. And you could also modify it using the unit offset, which is a number from zero to one, zero being the start of the line, one being the end. And it's pretty neat for mapping things onto, onto uh, lines like this. So um, after uh, 
the way that this is going to work, this is actually going to be used to, to position our cards. So basically the script is going to decide how much space the card needs, and then it will advance the offsets to take any of the blank space that's not being used. Then it'll place the first card, move over, place the second card, move over, place the third card, etc., and then reset. Uh, every time we place cards, it'll, it'll go through that process. The cards themselves will animate from where the hand is going to be, uh, or the, the deck, the dealer, if you will, is going to be. They'll fly into the positions unless they've already flown into the positions before, in which case they will just shift over as necessary as more cards get added. So to mark that deck position I talked about before, we're going to add another position 2D. And we're going to call this deck position. Actually, deck location. Um, you will notice when I was designing this project, I ended up using the deck location here under the, the hand. Uh, and the problem with that is that you have to actually physically change where the deck is going to be on every single object. So later on, we're probably going to modify this so that uh, there's only one place where that variable is kept and it'll get passed on uh, probably through a group call to everybody else so they all know how to set uh, all the players and the table know exactly where the deck location is going to be. Okay, so now we're going to add a script to our hand. Gonna make sure that we save it under the correct folder. And everything else should be good. Erase all that. So, first thing we're going to worry about is a variable to point at where the deck, deck is. And we'll create a, an array to hold all the cards. And this variable card path basically holds a string that we'll use to create the path to the correct resources that we use for the card sprites. It has to be uh, correct with the path that you actually have the assets stored in. So in our case, it's the cards folder, which is under res double slash graphics slash cards comes so. up. And we'll create something to hold the card with, with which will become relevant a little bit later. Uh, and we'll create an export variable in order to in order to change the, uh, the scale of the card as necessary. Um, when the player is playing, for example, the cards will look bigger because they're closer towards you in the perspective of the game. Uh, also, it makes it easier as a, to read your own cards as a player uh, as an added UI bonus. Um, and we'll want to change that for depending on uh, this hand will be used by table cards, by the opponent player, and by yourself. First thing we're going to use a uh, draw cards, can't type today, uh, function. And it will add some, some cards to the deck. So it's going to call the function from the deck called give cards. And it'll call that many cards. Then we're going to create our own function called sprite cards. And we're going to create another one called place cards to add the correct sprite to each card and then place them correctly in the hand. So I'm just going to copy and paste uh, from my reference project to save you from having to watch me type for this relatively simple thing. So the way the sprite cards function is going to work is it has a variable for the first part and the second part of the name of the pile file path, which then get combined into a full part, which isn't entirely necessary, but not entirely wasteful either. 
It's just going to iterate through every card in hand and uh, initialize the full part with nothing. Um, so first part is always just like the naming convention of our cards. It's always going to start with the suit. So we determine if the card suit of the card in the hand is a spade, and if it is, we'll call it spades, diamonds, clubs, hearts, etc. Then it's going to check the value. If the value is ace, if it has a card value of one, the second part is going to be ace.png, second part is going to be jack.png uh, for a jack or something with a value of 11, queen, king, etc. Um, and if it's none of those named cards, then it's just going to take the card value plus PNG. So if it was a five of spades, the name would be spades underscore five dot PNG. Um, and then full part's just going to combine that to make it good. And it will change. It will call uh, the cards change sprite function and give it the card path to where that resource is, that PNG, to change the sprite. Now we're going to move on to the place cards function. I'm just going to paste in some code here. So we'll talk about, I'll walk you through this. So the variable path length is the total length of that curve. We're going to use it for the offset so we know the maximum amount. So the way we do that is we access the path itself and the curve attached to it. And we use the get big length function, which returns the full length of the curve. Uh, space is going to be the total amount of space. It's going to be equal to path length. Um, and the ideal card width, we're going to take the width of a card and we're going to multiply it by a factor uh, to determine what we think the ideal space we want for our card in each position is going to be. And then the var variable card width, hand width is going to be the width of the entire hand, so every card in the hand. Um, so we're going to start by creating all of the cards here. So for every card in the hand, we're going to figure out its width. And then we're going to give it an ideal card width. Uh, we're using a factor of 1.5. Uh, this kind of makes it a little wider than the, well, half as much wide as the card itself. Um, I find that it works pretty good for how much I want to be able to see the cards as they're fanned out so that the suits can be somewhat identified. And um, because the cards are going to be angled slightly, uh, that number might vary depending on, on how our cards look on the curve. The hand width is uh, basically the ideal card width uh, times the hand size. So that's how wide the hand's going to be. And then finally, we're going to add the child, which instantiates uh, the scene. It actually makes it so that we can see it. Then we're going to determine uh, the space we have and make an offset uh, to take into account the bank blank space. So the space is the total space available and it is the path length. Um, and then we're going to set our, the offset to our path follow 2D to zero. So it's going to be all the way to the left on the curve. And if the hand width is less than the path length, which is ideal, um, it's going to create an offset by subtracting the hand width from the space and then taking that and divide it by two. And then uh, it's going to use that as its starting position. And I've added a print statement here that'll just show uh, that we're using the ideal card width space. Um, this is mostly handy, handy for, for troubleshooting. Um, if your curve's not long enough, it'll start trying to crowd the cards in as a default, which uh, for some games might be the preferred method. It'll just tighten them in. Um, this shouldn't be a condition that happens in this game. Like we should make sure the curve is large enough so that it always has a ideal card with space as opposed to the crowded space. The crowded space won't create the nice margins. It'll just stuff them in to fit. Um, 
and so it, it wouldn't have any of the, the offset margin there because there is no blank space and it's just going to divvy up the space equal to the hand size so that every card gets the same amount of space. Uh, the last thing we're going to do is we're going to go and iterate through the cards and we're going to set their positions. So the difference here, um, so we're going to add a check function or a variable, a true or false variable as to whether or not something is dealt. So the very first time a card is dealt, uh, it will take this, it'll say, oh, it hasn't been dealt. It'll start its initial position where the deck is positioned. And then it'll set these variables, the hand position and rotation based on the position of the deck spawner, um, which is this position here. We should actually change the name of it, deck spawner. So the deck spawner is uh, follows follows the path all the way along through, as mentioned before. Uh, and it's going to get the global rotation too. And that's the kind of cool thing about using the curves is you can actually fan out the cards kind of naturally because it'll take the, the rotation of the sprite or uh, of the position as it moves through the curve. Um, so the reason why we're setting it like this is that uh, the card is going to move to um, from its current position to the hand position. So it'll look like it flies across the screen uh, to where it has to go. And then it's going to mark it as true so that uh, if we use the place cards function again, any card that's already been dealt uh, will basically remain where it is. Uh, we might have to do some playing around with that later, but for now we're going to leave it. And uh, as it creates each of these cards are as it places each of the, them, the offset's going to increase so that the next card goes into the correct position. And then when all of this is done, the offset's going to reset itself to zero so that if we run this function again, it starts from where we expect it. This is actually kind of redundant code because at the start of the loop here, we can see that we set the offset to zero. But uh, I think I'm going to leave it in just for the sake of uh, preventing bugs. So now that we have that done, we're going to save it and we'll go back to the main scene, right, uh, left click on the main screen, and uh, we want to instance a child scene of type hand. And we're going to call this one player hand. Uh, now the player hand, we're going to add to a group players and we're going to go to the card save this we're going to go to the card itself take a look at its script and start playing with that so the first thing we're going to do with this is we're going to add the variable to determine if it was dealt and we'll default it to false And we're going to have to create a um, variable for the hand position. This is the position that uh, no matter how the, the card moves, it'll know that this is the position it's supposed to be in the hand, and it will change in that iterative loop we made in the hand scene. And we're just going to set these as blank vectors, vector twos for now. And now we're going to create a movement function using the tweens. I'm just going to copy and paste this in here. So um, without getting too deep into the tween node, basically uh, the our move card function will need the destination of where it's going and it can take uh, rotation and a scale as needed. So um, 
the first move is going to move it from its position to the destination. Um, it will do that in 0 0.7 seconds. It will use this type of tween, trans back, and it will ease out. Um, and if there's a rotate called for, it will use this information. And if there's a scale, again, the same thing. So um, assuming that all of these variables are functioned, it will, it will move it in the 0.7 seconds, it will rotate it in the same time, and it will change the scale in the same time, and then the tween will start. Um, I don't want to get too deep into tweens. Uh, if you need any more information, you can just check out the fairly good documentation on the Godot website. And one last function we're going to add. What do we call it? I think it was kill card. Yeah kill card and this will just be used when we want to get rid of all of our cards uh, to destroy them because in between rounds we're basically going to reset the entire deck we'll destroy every card instance and then we'll recreate the deck on the deck so this is just setting up for that now we're going to move back into the main scene and we're going to modify our scripts so that it actually tests out a little bit more. So we're going to add some more variables to the top just to reference uh, all the scenes that we need to access. Uh, this doesn't exist yet. We'll just comment that out for now. All right, so uh, the ready function we're just going to change so that it draws a couple of cards on the players. So we're going to use the call group function. Um, this is going to come in handy uh, because we do have two players. We're going to be able to tell both of them to draw cards at the same time. Uh, and that uh, that will just allow it for a simple call during the various streets. Um, I've added these yields here just to slow things down a bit. Um, sometimes when you start the game, especially it uh, it takes its sweet time, or it takes a sweet time loading, so you don't necessarily see the the tweens. So um, I just manually added in these little timers here as just testing measures. So if we hit play now, in theory, we should see some output. Oh, alas, I see the problem already. So the player hand is supposed to be part of the card controller. And if it's not, the path that I set in there won't work. So in theory, now it should work. There we go. And I just reset the environment there so that I have a black screen. There we go. So uh, that little Godot thing was there mostly for testing. As you can see, it's a little wider than I intended, so I'll probably change that 1.5 to something else. Uh, let's just add a third card to see what this looks like. I guess I could just draw two for the second call. Well, that's not bad. That looks a lot better. Anyway, we'll play around with those uh, once we get to setting things up for uh, our visual components and the table and everything. So now we're going to go into our hand. We're going to go to scene, new inherited scene, and base it on hand again. This one we're going to call the enemy hand. And we will remove the script, add a new inherited script. So we're going to go and find our hand script. And that's what it's going to be called, but we're going to place it in the scripts folder. Perfect. All right, so um, 
we'll just leave this blank for now and go into the main scene. Um, sorry, we should save this scene first. So go back to the main scene and oops, click the card controller and instance the child scene called enemy hand. Uh, for the enemy hand, first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to go to the path, path 2D, click on inspector, and we're going to make this curve unique, uh, just in case we want to modify it. Uh, the next thing we're going to do, well, let's, oops, wrong key. Oh, I should move that dot first. There we go. I'm going to move you up there, and we'll hit play and see what happens. There we go. All right, uh, that's one problem we made there, um, is that we forgot to add the enemy hand to the player's group. So now if we play the main scene, both players will get the same amount of cards, and as you can see, the ratio is the same. So we're going to change that in just a second. If we go into this new script that we just made, and we're going to override. So if you have a function that's inherited in an inherited script, you can take any other function that's in the parent and you can just do something else by creating a new function of the same name. Uh, so for our sprites card for the enemies, we're going to go through each card. It's basically the same thing, change the sprite. And we're going to change the sprite to uh, this card back because I like it. And that should be all we need to do for that. So now if we run the scene, because this card's got re-sprited, now we can no longer see the enemy cards. Really don't like the way the, the cards are fanning out here, but we're going to fix that a little bit later. All right, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to create a new scene, 2D scene, and we're going to call it table. Table is going to need, until we fix this, we're going to need a position 2D, and we're actually going to need two position 2Ds. The first one we're going to call deck, which is going to do the same thing it does for all of our card holders. It's going to determine where the cards fly in from. Uh, the second position 2D is going to be called left point. And left point is going to be where the cards get dealt from. That should be good for now. Um, we're now going to, on top of the table, attach a GG script. And this is going to actually inherit from the hand because it does a lot of the same functionality. And we're going to make sure that this goes into scripts and create it. Uh, we're also going to save our scene here. And uh, the biggest difference here for the table is that it is going to place cards a little bit differently. So we'll create a variable called card distance, which is going to be how uh, the distance between each card <laughs> and we'll make a reference oops, to our left point. Uh, we're going to add this for later. It will come in handy. So it's just a function to draw three cards, uh, which will be used on the flop. And we'll add a function called place cards, which is going to override the place cards function in the parent script. So the way we're going to lay out our hands, actually, I'm just going to copy and paste this little block of code. 
So it, it's just going to start from the left location and keep adding the card distance uh, every time it lays down a card. Uh, and it's going to do it in a pretty simple fashion. It's going to iterate through the hand size and it's going to uh, determine the Y position will always be the same as the start position's Y, and then the X position will be the start position X, or start point position X, plus the card distance times whichever card it's at. Um, and then we'll add, add a child to the table uh, so that we can actually see the card in the scene. And again, it does the same loop as the other one. Uh, it determines if it was dealt and if it was not dealt, then it will start its position. And then uh, look, all the cards will move into their correct positions using the tween. So we're gonna go into the hand scene and we're gonna go into the node and we're gonna add a group called card holders that'll apply to anybody that, uh, any scene that's based off of the hand scene. Uh, so in this case, the player hand and the enemy hand, uh, because the table is not actually a child of that scene, we're going to have to manually add in card holder, card holders uh, there as well. And this is going to be used mostly to reset the game. It'll tell all card holders to destroy their decks, basically. And uh, so that's what we're using that as a placeholder for for now. So if we look at our output right now, we'll notice that the cards are drawing kind of funny. And if we look down into our output, we can see that the output is being listed as crowded, um, which was something we we're trying to avoid. I actually played with it for a second offline and found the problem. Uh, it's actually a code problem. Um, so we're going to first go to the card itself and where it determines the card width, it's actually supposed to use the scale of the hand node, not the sprite itself as a multiplier, because this is the factor that we are changing when we change the scale. Um, the scale will always be five times otherwise. So already that should fix that problem. There, perfectly. So we can see that the space is correct. Uh, 36 and 24 respectively is the spacing for the hand. Um, additional thing that I noticed is that the draw flop function, um, the draw flop function, which I created here is incorrectly named. It should be draw flop. And uh, other than that, we are good to go. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go into the hand. And we're going to add a new function that's going to come in handy called reset hand. And it's just going to iterate through the hand. And it's going to call our kill card function. And then when it's done, it will reset the hand variable to a blank. All right, now with that done, we're going to go back to our main scene, go back into this clip here. We'll uncomment these since they're both going to exist, especially after we right click on card controller, instance of child scene, table. Uh, now that we've done that, we're going to add in our ready for testing oops, table, and we're going to tell it to draw flop. So let's test it out for our final output check for this part. 
and everything seems to be working correctly. The spacing isn't great, but the size isn't what we wanted at either. So in the next video, we're going to create our actual um, background images. Uh, we'll add the table, and we'll put placeholders for the player and enemy health, and we'll add a nice image uh, in the back for the enemy. And that'll result in us having to reposition and rescale some of these card objects. After that, we're going to um, put in the war card functionality. Um, once we have the table sorted out, we're going to have an idea of what, um, where those cards are going to get placed. So we'll create that functionality, and um, then we'll work on getting our game loop a little bit more developed, so we can actually have a reasonable gameplay going. And we'll see what we get completed in the next video, and then we might start working into the logic for identifying winning hands. So I hope uh, everybody's enjoying this series so far. Uh, please feel free to give any feedback or questions in the comments and uh, give the video a like. And feel free to subscribe if you're interested in what I'm doing. I'm planning on releasing smaller videos for smaller concepts. Uh, and this video series is probably going to slow down to about once every two weeks after the next video. Uh, mostly because I have a lot of homework to do before I'm willing to present some of the stuff that's in it. So thanks very much.